Hello, and welcome to this Nature Research custom media webcast titled Improving Antibody Drug Candidate Success Through Developability Assessments. My name is Jay Shan Carpen, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is produced by Unchained Labs. We'll begin the webcast with presentations from Dr. Yaksek Ostrovsky of Alivamab Discovery Services and Dr. Kevin Lance of Unchained Labs. We'll then end with a Q&A session. To ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says ask a question and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. And now over to Kevin. Hello and welcome. I'll be introducing and giving some background to the antibody stability and aggregation characterization part of this webinar and the instrument used for much of the analysis. Just like picking out the best book from this library, picking out just the best antibody candidate can leave you feeling a bit like the statue on the left, overwhelmed. In this webinar, Yasek and I will talk about how characterization using the uncle from Unchained Labs is a valuable part of a developability workflow to help ID the best performing options. When thinking about the stability of a protein, we can summarize it as two different options, conformational and colloidal. Conformational stability, shown in blue on the left, is the ability of a protein to stay folded in its native state. Thankfully, examining a protein's fluorescence is one way to gain insight into the conformational stability of a protein and is an easy way to examine thermally induced unfolding. Colloidal stability, shown on the right and green, can be thought of as the aggregation behavior of a protein. Gathering size information from static and dynamic light scattering can inform the understanding of a protein's colloidal stability. Both of these behaviors combine to paint a fuller picture of a protein's stability. So that leads us to the uncle and its ability to gather conformational and colloidal information to paint a fuller picture of protein stability. Uncle is an all-in-one multimodal biologic stability platform that combines three detection methods in 12 applications to help, to help you understand the stability and aggregation behavior of your proteins. To test any of these applications, only nine microliters of sample is needed, and up to 48 samples can be run at once. Those three detection methods are full spectrum fluorescence, static light scattering, or SLS, and dynamic light scattering, or DLS. Uncle can see the full spectrum for fluorescence to give the option to look at protein intrinsic fluorescence and evaluate tyrosine and tryptophan fluorescence, or use any of an arsenal of fluorescent dyes. Simultaneous with that fluorescence experiment, you can use static light scattering to monitor how the same sample aggregates. Uncle uses SLS at two wavelengths so you can track small and large particles at the same time. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is Uncle's third detection method and it is a highly sensitive technique to give you details about your protein's size and size distribution. Besides gathering size data, DLS is powerful for understanding what's in your sample and it can be used to quality check proteins before you start an experiment. All of this is done with temperature control, so you can make these measurements at room temperature, elevated temperature, or more commonly, across a thermal ramp. Now allow me to introduce one of the key features of UNCLE, the UNI sample holder. The UNI is one of the unique features of the system with a small sample volume and no limit to the type of sample. The UNI is composed of an array of 16 quartz cubettes that are easily loaded with a pipette. The high-grade quartz gets us great optical sensitivity for fluorescence and light scattering data, and the frame is an anodized aluminum that provides efficient heat transfer. After a sample is loaded, it is clipped into the blue frame shown at the bottom of the slide, where silicone gaskets on either side ensure the sample uh, is always sealed, and there's no risk for evaporation as temperature increases. It's also easy to pop in and out of an incubator or fridge if you want to make a measurement over the course of weeks or months. The UNI is what makes the UNCLE truly unique, providing a combination of throughput and small sample volume. Here's an overview of how proteins fluoresce, coming from the aromatic residues that emit fluorescence. Here we see tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. The aromatic residues, when they're buried in the native protein, are in a hydrophobic environment. And as proteins unfold, they become exposed to the aqueous environment, which changes their fluorescence behavior. The changes in the tertiary structure of the protein can therefore be detected by observing the protein intrinsic fluorescence, 
which is really the aggregate of all the fluorescent amino acids present in a protein. Typical changes in fluorescence intensity and peak position are observed when a protein becomes less compactly folded as it uh, is exposed to increasing temperatures during a thermal ramp. So over a heat ramp, Uncle will excite and read the full spectrum fluorescence of a protein sample at numerous temperatures. Each line in this graph is a fluorescence read of a protein excited with a 266 nanometer laser, starting with the read at 15 degrees Celsius and going all the way up to 95 degrees. You can see by following the curves from top to bottom how they shift to the right side of the graph, which are the longer wavelengths. This phenomenon is called a red shift and occurs because the protein is unfolding and those buried uh, amino acids are becoming exposed to aqueous environment. Those buried residues have a shifting fluorescence emission and that's what, what causes the ultimate redshift of the protein. This protein shows that classic redshift pattern, but you never know how each protein will behave until you've tried it. Some proteins shift to the left, which is, which is called a blue shift, while others can decrease in fluorescence without a shift. With this way of collecting full spectrum fluorescence, you have all the data and you don't have to worry about unexpected protein behaviors. For proteins without tryptophan, Uncle also has a 473 nanometer laser that can be used as cypher orange dye to excite fluorescence and determine unfolding. The analysis method we recommend reports the barycentric mean, or BCM, shown on the left. This is the wavelength that evenly divides the area under the curve as a kind of spectral center of mass. We found that this analysis method is the least susceptible to noise since it integrates a large range of the fluorescent spectrum. On the right of the slides is an analysis of a protein's fluorescence that shows unfolding and identifies the inflection points in the BCM versus temperature graph as protein melting temperatures. So Uncle delivers this fluorescence data simultaneously with gathering SLS data to get protein thermal stability and aggregation information in just a single experiment. Here we're looking at the results of a thermal ramp experiment where protein fluorescence is being tracked in blue and SLS is in green. Fluorescence shows your proteins unfolding and quantifies that with melting temperatures at TM1 and TM2 shown with blue arrows. The SLS data in green shows the aggregation behavior of your protein and reports the temperature when aggregation begins as TAG shown with the green arrow. Notice how the TAG event lines up with TM2, linking the second unfolding event to aggregation of the protein. Together, the two protein tools of intrinsic fluorescence and SLS give you an understanding of how unfolding and aggregation is occurring in response to thermal stress. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is UNCLE's third detection method, and it is a highly sensitive technique to give you data on your protein size and size distribution. Here we're looking at some example data of a monomeric sample in blue, a sample of some aggregation in green, and a sample with significant aggregation in yellow. I want to point out that the x-axis is shown on a log scale. The metrics that are reported from DLS data are the z average diameter, which is a weighted average of diameter, and a polydispersity index value, or PDI, which is a measure of the width of the size distribution. Looking left to right across the slide at these samples, we see an increasing trend in the z average diameter, which agrees with what we know about the sample state. Likewise, the size distributions for these samples widen as you look left to right. Since higher PDI values indicate wider size distributions, PDI would also show an increasing trend here. In this case, the sample on the left is close to room temperature, and the temperature increases to the mid-70s once you've gotten all the way to the right. B22 and the diffusion interaction parameter, or KD, offer quick ways to peek at non-specific protein-protein interactions for your protein and formulation combination. In this experiment, we use DLS and SLS to examine the same protein across a set of concentrations. DLS is used, is used for calculating KD, and SLS is used to calculate B22. If the protein has attractive forces with itself, then at concentra as concentration increases, it will slow down and you get results shown like the red line here. If the protein is repulsive to itself, then as concentration increases, it appears to speed up and the results look like the green line. B22 follows a similar logic, but using a light scattering parameter as its output rather than diffusion coefficient. So the desirable result in a B22 and KD experiment 
is an increasing slope like the green line here that indicates a repulsive interaction between your formulation uh, between your protein in the formulation tested. Actual data looks like this. Here we see B2T results for an antibody in four formulation, its commercial formulation, and its commercial formulation with three excipients added. The commercial formulation alone, or with sucrose added, perform the best and have desirable repulsive interactions. With the addition of arginine or sodium chloride, these strong repulsive behaviors are impaired and the new formulation performs worse than the original. That's how you can get a quick room temperature answer on the performance of protein formulation combinations using UNCLE. Using these tools on the UNCLE can get you from that overwhelming multitude of choices to choosing the best option. And now, Yasek will introduce Alivimab Discovery Services and speak to their workflow and UNCLE's role in an antibody developability assessment. I would like to start by thanking both Nature and Unchained Labs for inviting me to speak today. My name is Jacek Ostrowski, and I'm the Associate Director of Protein Science at Alivimab Discovery Services. Today, I will be discussing steps that can be taken during antibody generation and lead selection that help improve the chances of success during cell line development and manufacturing. As a brief introduction to Alivimab Discovery Services, our roots stretch back to 2014 when Ablexis launched Alivimab Mouse, the best platform available for licensing for human antibody discovery and development. By 2018, the majority of the world's top 15 pharma had licensed Alivimab Mouse. Ablexis launched a variety of new, flexible licensing terms to make Alivimab Mouse more accessible to smaller companies. In parallel, Alivimab Discovery Services was founded in 2018 to create an organization that really understands what it takes to conduct efficient and successful antibody drug discovery for partners. Through two separate companies, Ablexis and Levomab Discovery Service together offer the best solution for antibody drug discovery. Together, Ablexis's Levomab Mouse Technology and Levomab Discovery Services put our partners' project on the fastest and most efficient path through discovery and development and into the clinic. We are the fastest to the value inflection point of delivering panels of confirmed, functionally active, truly molecularly diverse lead candidate antibodies. We eliminate the cost and time and money and the added risk of in vivo display fat platforms, antibody humanization, and even other transgenic platforms and antibody recovery processes. Antibodies identified in Levomab mouse and some other mammalian in vivo systems have better biophysical properties than antibodies identified through display or antibodies engineered in display, which supports their fast and efficient path through development and into the clinic. According to the publication from Jane et al., antibodies generated through in vivo systems are three times more likely to have clean developability profiles than antibodies generated from display technologies. Our strategy for antibody discovery is to leverage multiple technologies across our program to limit the risks associated with both discovery and development. Well before we select antibodies for developability assessment, we want to ensure that panels of unique and diverse antibodies are identified that meet the target product profile for activity. In the rare event that a candidate antibody has developability issues, we want to be sure that suitable backups are available. For most programs, we bring forward at least a dozen sequence diverse antibodies to select for developability assessment. Our projects start with Alivimab mouse, the only transgenic animal designed for both discovery and development. A strong immune response is key to every good discovery campaign. ADS has unique immunization strategies called AMPT. AMPT immunizations are rapid two to four weeks and can include protein, DNA, cells, tumor immunizations, or a combination, and they are robust. Our broad sampling of Levomab's mouse immune repertoire ensures a high diversity of antibodies through our enrichment process and the ability to access both plasma and memory B cells. Our deep screening strategies allow us to screen hundreds of thousands of hybridomas in a broad set of robust assays, allowing ADS to pick winners in as few as 23 days after the start of a program, and that timeline includes immunization. Our ability to characterize antibodies at this early junction for kinetics, functional, 
activity and cross species reactivity ensures multiple leads are advancing to developability assessments. After we identify multiple antibodies that meet or exceed the TPP, these winners rapidly advance to cloning, sequencing, and purification, resulting in a diverse panel of lead antibodies that can advance into a battery of developability assessments that ensure our partners' selected leads have the requisite drug-like properties of activity and developability needed in a successful drug candidate. Cell line development and manufacturing is an expensive and time-consuming activity. Early developability assessments both in silico and in vitro to predict stability, expression, self-interaction, and nonspecific binding can reduce the risk before entering this phase. Poor antibody stability and antibody aggregation cause, can cause issues in manufacturing, lower shelf life, and can lead to increased immunogenicity. Poor low pH stability or thermal instability can lead to aggregation and loss of activity. Cell line development is often completed in Cho cells, and while steps can be taken to improve antibody yields, assessing expression levels through transient expression at this time is a good indicator of how much optimization will be needed in cell line development to achieve high yields. Buffer pH high concentrations, and buffer formulations are all factors that can promote aggregation and selection of a formulation buffer is a non-trivial task. We also assess to eliminate antibodies with non-specific binding and stickiness liabilities, which in human clinical trials can manifest as poor pharmacokinetics and serious adverse events and even patient death. In this case study, I will discuss how Levamab Discovery Services rapidly identified over 200 functional high affinity antibodies that meet the target product profile from a client. Of the over 200 antibodies, 57 were sequenced and the top seven were selected to proceed through a battery of developability assessment assays. The client company was operating virtually with a target, disease linkage, seed funding, and no labs yet. Their target product profile required antibodies with KD values of less than 100 picomolar that blocked the ligands binding to both of its GPCR receptors. Working with the partner, we put together a work plan that included sourcing materials, generating cell lines, and developing functional assays. Having the functional assays built and validated for use in high throughput screening was critical to the rapid, efficient execution of the project as it is for all projects run at ADS. The benefit of Levamab's hybridomas is that they are antibody factories that make high concentrations of antibodies for a whole cascade of rapid, reliably predictive assays. The partner's target product profile required dual blockers, and we found hundreds in the ADS built assays for high throughput screens. We took the top 384 dual blockers into octet off-rate assessment to select for high affinity, again, to very early identify and winnow down the best leads for the partner's TPP. This funneled down our partner's candidate list to approximately 200 antibodies. Working with the partner and using the functional and off-rate data, the top 57 antibodies were sequenced. The sequence diversity was fantastic, with 95% of the antibodies having unique molecular diversity at the heavy chain CDR3. This is indicated by the bubble plot. Of the 57 antibodies, seven were advanced to developability assessment. We use our proprietary Aleva line software to look for potential deamidation, isomerization, glycosylation, and methionine oxidation sites in the antibody amino acid sequence. Why are we looking for these possible liabilities? It is because these liabilities can result in decreased bioactivity, alter the pharmacokinetics, and increase antigenicity of the antibody. By assessing at the lead candidate selection stage, the antibodies of no potential liabilities can be advanced, and those with potential liabilities can be set aside. However, 70% of in silico predicted potential liabilities really do not manifest as true physical liabilities in the real world. Thus, physical studies need to be conducted to assess these potential liabilities, which I will discuss in a later slide. As mentioned two slides back, seven antibodies were selected to move forward for developability assessments. 
These antibody sequences were analyzed with our Levaline software package for liability prediction. Assessment primarily looks at deamidation sites in which aspartgene is converted to aspartic acid or isoaspartic acid, isomerization sites where aspartic acid is converted to isoaspartic acid, glycosylation sites where cellular machinery will recognize the sequence and glycosylate it, and methionine oxidation where methionine is oxidized to methionine sulfoxide. The graphs above show the potential heavy chain and light chain CDR liabilities in this set of seven antibodies. The CDRs are regions of the antibody that interf interface with the antigen. So any changes in the amino acid at these sites may risk the antibody's efficacy and potency by changing how the antibody binds the antigen. For the seven antibodies that were assessed, none of the antibodies showed any deamidation risks or methionine oxidation risks in the CDRs. We only had one glycosylation risk in ADS-707, and this is known to be encoded in the germline VH gene used in this antibody. The isomerization risk was seen in only one heavy chain CDR and was found in four of the seven light chain CDRs. Because these are risks predicted by the software, there are potential liabilities and must be assessed in the lab to see if any of these will manifest during manufacturing. The next steps in Levamab Discovery Services Developability Assessment are to investigate antibody expression and stability profiles. This is broken down into five distinct experiments. The first is to look at antibody yields post CHO expression and protein A purification. Second, we looked at the ability of the antibodies to tolerate low pH. This is important because typically during manufacturing, a viral inactivation step at pH 3.5 for one hour occurs right after eluding antibodies from protein A. The lead candidate antibody needs to remain stable under these conditions. The next set of experiments looks at the melting and aggregation temperatures of antibodies. These give insight into how well the heavy chain and light chains are pairing and if there are any intrinsic antibody stability issues. A low temperature stability test is also run on the antibodies. It is known in some instances that when antibodies are cycled through low temperature, they may tend to aggregate, indicating stability issues. As mentioned on the previous slide, one of the early metrics for determining antibody developability is to analyze the initial transient expression yields post protein A purification. We use a licensed CHO expression system for all recombinantly produced antibodies. CHO is the cell line from which the majority of clinical antibodies are expressed. We run two expression experiments to account for transfection variability. After expression and clarification, the antibodies are purified by protein A in similar conditions to manufacturing runs to determine their yields. The figure shows the expression levels of all the tested antibodies in this study. Red and green bars are set for poor expressing antibody levels below 20 mg per liter for good expressing antibody levels between 20 and 100 mg per liter and excellent antibody expression levels above 100 mg per liter. These numbers are based on many years of antibody expression experience. None of the seven antibodies fell into the poor category. One antibody that expressed at 33 mg per liter is low, but it is something that can be improved during cell line development. Three of the seven antibodies had really excellent expression above 100 mg per liter. Switching gears, we are now going to discuss developability assessment workflows using the UNCLE instrument. Unchained Labs has made the whole process easy to execute. Samples are diluted to 1 mg per mil in PBS and are then loaded in duplicate into the 9 microliter sample holders, which are called UNIs. The unis are then loaded into the instrument and within about two hours, the analysis complete. On the right-hand side of the slide is a typical thermal analysis from an antibody that was studied in this case study. The thermal melting curve triangles is denoted as fluorescence and the solid vertical line is the melting temperature. The way the instrument measures the melting temperature is by looking at a redshift in the fluorescence spectrum that is indicative in these cases of the antibody becoming more solvent exposed. In some cases, two melting temperatures can be seen for antibodies. The T onset is shown as a vertical dashed line, and this is where the antibody starts to melt. 
Two measurements of aggregations are conducted at 266 nanometers and 473 nanometers as the melting occurs. These are represented by a dashed dot and the dotted vertical lines, respectively, and are shown in the thermal analysis around 80 degrees C. It is important to note that the 266 nanometer aggregation will usually have a slightly lower onset temperature than the 473 nanometer measurement. Thermal assessment of antibodies gives information on the physical antibody stability. The general principle is the higher the melting temperature, the more stable an antibody is. The lower the melting temperature, the less stable an antibody is. But there are also two other melting phenomena that give insight into the antibody stability, which are the melting temperature onset and the aggregation temperature. The melting onset temperature is when the antibody first starts to melt. This value is always below the melting temperature, and depending on how low and how far below the melting temperature is a determinant of antibody stability. Also, the aggregation temperature gives insight into how the antibody is behaving during thermal decomposition. Is the antibody first melting, then aggregating, or does aggregation coincide with the melting temperature closely? We have determined that good antibodies have melting temperatures above 60 degrees C, and good melting onset temperature is above 55 C, and a good aggregation temperature is above 60 degrees C. For the seven tested antibodies, all were above the noted good for melting temperature, good for the onset temperature, and good for aggregation temperatures. ADS-704 and ADS-707 both had very high melting temperatures and subsequently had very high aggregation temperatures near or just above 80 degrees C. Interestingly, for ADS-705, its melting temperature is identical to its aggregation temperature. As previously mentioned, antibodies are held at low pH for about an hour post-protein A purification. This is a critical step in antibody manufacturing as it is vital for viral inactivation. The viral inactivation typically occurs, occurs at pH 3.5 at room temperature. For this low pH stability experiment, we are starting with antibodies that have monomeric content greater than 95% and then buffer exchanging them into a citrate buffer at pH 3.2, 3.5, and 3.7. The reason we are looking at pH 3.2 is to see how low of a pH the antibody can withstand. And we are looking at pH 3.7 because this is the highest allowable pH for viral inactivation during manufacturing. If antibodies do not pass these assays and aggregation is seen at all pHs, the manufacturing process will have to be modified to use detergents, and this is a costly increase in the manufacturing process. What we are doing in this experiment is holding antibodies at pH 3.2, 3.5, and 3.7 for one hour, then neutralizing with TRIS and running the samples on size exclusion HPLC to assess any changes to the monomeric composition of the antibody. We run this against a naive control, the non-treated antibody. In the chromatogram, we have an overlay of one of the seven antibodies that was tested. In this overlay, each color represents a pH, and what we are looking for are increases in aggregates which come off where the highlighted red circle lies. One other thing that we are looking for when making these assessments is the area under the main peak curve. We are looking for this <clears throat> number to remain constant, which indicates no loss of antibody material. In some cases, the monomeric content of the antibody may remain the same, but a significant loss of area under the curve means aggregation has occurred, yet cannot be visualized by size exclusion HPLC because the aggregate is too big to enter the column matrix. All seven antibodies that were tested under these conditions withstood exceptionally all tested pH with all the monomeric content being above 95%. And because the area under the curve remained constant means the antibodies remain soluble at low pH. Testing antibodies for stability at low temperature also gives insight into the antibody stability and propensity to aggregate. It may be necessary to store, store bulk material during the manufacturing process, and the best way to achieve this is to freeze the material. It is a known phenomenon that some antibodies aggregate when exposed to a freeze-thaw cycle. In this experiment, the antibodies are, at, are in 1x PBS and are subjected to 5-3 freeze-thaw rounds. 
the sample was placed at minus 80 for 20 minutes and then thawed at room temperature for 20 minutes and this is repeated once the antibody samples have been cycled the material is then run on size exclusion hplc and compared against a naive sample in this case the non-thermally treated antibody the chromatogram shows the analysis for one of the tested antibodies the two traces that we are looking at are the naive antibody which is the green trace shown on the bottom and the freeze thaw treated antibody which is the blue trace on top the first feature that we are looking for in these chromatograms is the appearance of the aggregate peak which is located to the left of the main antibody monomer peak in this example there is a slight rise in the amount of aggregate material present compared to the non-treated antibody the other feature we are looking for in the HPLC chromatograms is to discuss is discussed on the previous slide is the area under the curve of the main peak to gauge if there has been significant monomeric loss of the antibody the bar graph on the right hand side of the slide is the compiled data from the experiment described what we are looking for in the bar chart is the bars is that the bars reside at or above 95 percent monomeric content meaning that there has been little or no change in the amount of antibody monomer content for the seven antibodies that were tested under these conditions all of the antibodies held up exceptionally well to the five freeze thaw cycles only one antibody ads705 the monomeric antibody content dropped below 95 percent but this is just below the 95 percent mark also, in this experiment, the area under the curve remained constant for the monomeric peak of all the samples. We are now going to discuss other critical aspects of the developability studies, the self-interaction assessments and nonspecific binding studies. In the self-interaction studies, we are learning how the antibodies behave in a buffered solution. Are the antibodies experiencing attractive forces or repulsive forces? and how much are these aspects of the antibody buffer and pH dependent. In addition to the buffer and pH experiments, we also test how a purified antibody behaves when it's concentrated past 10, 10 mg per mil and diluted to 1 mg per mil. This experiment gives insight into the antibody's propensity to aggregate when subjected to high concentrations. The next study in this set of experiments is to investigate how sticky the antibodies may be. This entails looking at antibody binding to a panel of antigens by the ELISA assay, and secondly, looking at the baclovirus particle ELISA. The ELISA-based assays are known to correlate well with PK studies, and the stickier the antibody, the poorer the PK results. The workflow for KD and B22 measurements will be described in this slide. First, antibodies need to be concentrated to greater than 20 mg per mil. These are then buffer exchanged into the appropriate pH buffer and filtered through a 0.2 micron membrane. For this set of experiments, concentration ranges from 10 mg per mil down to 2 mg per mil at intervals of 2 mg per mil. The samples are loaded into the unis in triplicate. So into a single uni, we load the five test concentrations and a corresponding buffer only sample. Thus, for the three pH conditions that are being tested, three unis are being run simultaneously, and the experiment requires about three milligrams of antibody. The KD and B22 readout for a tested antibody sample are shown to the right of the uncle instrument. These two traces are for one of the seven tested antibodies. The KD graph shows two positive sloping lines and one negative sloping line. We are looking for positive slopes that indicate that the antibodies are repulsive while a negative slope indicates attractive forces. As you can imagine, a flat slope is indicative of neither attractive nor repulsive forces. In the B22 graph, we are looking for similar characteristics where a positive slope indicates repulsive forces and a negative slope indicates attractive forces. The final buffer formulation of the antibody is a critical aspect of the manufacturing process. This is the buffer the antibody will spend anywhere from a few months to many years when stored. That is why manufacturers have large formulation teams to ensure that a product, that products being produced during manufacturing can be stably formulated for many years. For buffer formulations, there are many possible choices. It is also imperative during developability assessments to determine a possible buffer formulation for the antibody. This may lower the cost of the manufacturing process, saving the customer money. With this in mind, 
our initial buffer formulation is based on a phosphate citrate combination. And this was found to be one of the more common buffers for antibodies used in formulation. Also, pH of the buffer can greatly affect an antibody's tendency to aggregate or repel, and this has to do with the antibody's charge state in the formulation buffer. A majority of antibodies are stored between pH 4.5 and 6.5. We tested the seven antibodies in the manner described on the previous slide. We are looking for positive KD and B22 slopes for each tested pH to determine an appropriate buffer formulation for the antibody. When both are positive, this is indicated by a check mark shown in the table. If both slopes are negative or one slope, or one slope either KD or B22 is negative, this is indicated by a blank in the table. Four of the seven antibodies have been matched with an appropriate storage buffer. The remaining three antibodies that did not have a buffer match will need to be further tested in additional buffers. Antibody specificity ELISA assays are another way to select antibody candidates to move into manufacturing. These assays are used to determine the stickiness of an antibody. What is meant by this is that if an antibody binds to a panel proteins, the PSR assay, or bacrovirus particles, the BVP assay, there is a good correlation between the extent of binding and having poor PK properties. The stronger the binding response in these assays, the poorer the circulation half-life of the antibody. When running these assays, we looked for a control antibody that has a strong signal in the PSR and BVP assays. In this case, it is bocosizumab, which has a poor PK profile and elicit anti-drug antibody formation in 44% of patients in phase three clinical trials. And the negative control antibody, one that had little to no signal in the assays, is cetuximab. We also imposed a stringent cutoff at 0.1. Anything below that value indicates a strong candidate that should have no foreseen PK issues. We observed little to no binding in the PSR and BVP assay for all seven of the tested antibodies. Only one candidate, ADS703, showed a small amount of binding in the PSR and BVP assays when compared to other tested antibodies. However, it is not expected for this antibody to have any PK issues. As a final assessment, accelerated stability studies are conducted on antibodies where potential liabilities were identified through the Aleva line software. Potential liabilities identified in the silico assessment may manifest or could be false positives, so we conduct accelerated stability studies to follow up on any potential liabilities. In a, an accelerated stability study, antibodies are put through a set of conditions that accelerate deamidation, isomerization, and oxidation at multiple time points. This is either through low pH holds, two to four weeks, high pH holds, two to four weeks, or strong oxidizing conditions for about an hour. Once these antibodies have been subjected to those conditions, they are retested in biological assays and compared against the, and compared against the non-treated antibodies. The tested antibodies are also investigated by LCMSMS analysis to determine the extent of deamidation, isomerization, and oxidation compared to the non-treated antibodies. In summary, in only three months, ADS identified 200 antibodies that met the target product profile for function and very high affinity. These high affinity, high potency antibodies were generated in Alivamab mouse, avoiding the necessity of both in vitro affinity optimization and antibody humanization, saving many months of time in discovery. From this panel of 200 lead candidates, seven of the best functional antibodies were selected for a comprehensive developability assessment. Because developability is a critical component when selecting lead candidates. One antibody, ADS706, is a good candidate to move forward into manufacturing without additional testing. Another, ADS704, likely is also a good candidate to progress, but it should be tested in additional buffer formulations. Accelerated stability studies with the five remaining antibodies are ongoing to confirm that any potential liabilities identified in the silico assessment were false positives. Early assessment for developability can save significant time and money in CMC 
And Aliva Mad Discovery Services is proud to offer these capabilities to further assist our partners with our highly efficient industry-leading timelines in antibody drug discovery. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Once again, I would like to thank both Nature and Unchained Labs for inviting me to speak today. I would also like to thank all of the people at ADS that have made this work possible. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations, Jack and Kevin. It's now time for the Q&A to ask the speakers a question. Just type it in where it says ask a question and then press submit. Our first question, uh, and I think this one's for you, Kevin, uh, and it asks um, how much sample is needed per sample on the uh, on-call? So on the on-call, uh, we have these very, very tiny uh, cuvettes in our uni system. So each one requires 8.8 .8 microliters and a minimum mass you know, for an antibody of about uh, less than about half of a microgram. So if our lower limit of concentration is about 50 microgram per mil and you need about 8.8 .8 microliters, then you only need about 450 nanograms uh, total mass. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. I think this next question is also for you too. Uh, and it asks, um, is there a filter to prevent the uh, laser wavelength uh, from appearing in the profile? Uh, yep, yeah, I saw that one uh, come in early on in the presentation. So the way that the uncle works is because the lasers are coming into the sample at 90 degrees from the detectors of the sample, uh, that the only laser light that is picked up you know, for the 266 nanometer and 470 nanometer laser. The only laser light that's picked up is what's been scattered by the sample. So that's how we get SLS data uh, in the uncle is because that laser light wouldn't normally pass through the detector. It only gets the detector if it's, if it's been scattered. Uh, so that's how we should take advantage of, of using those laser profiles uh, in the, the final data. Excellent, thanks, Kevin. Uh, our next question, I think, is for you, um, Jack. And this one asks: um, In the um, self-aggregation studies uh, that were run, uh, what additional buffer would you test to find a possible formulation for antibodies that didn't make it through um, the original screen? Thank you very much for the question. That's a very good question. Um, the additional buffers I would look at would be um, a histidine-only buffer solution as well as a citric acid-only buffer solution to look for antibodies, to um, look at the antibody aggregation profiles of those during the KD and B22 measurements. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. And our next question asks, um, is there an advantage between one of the two constants, uh, B22 versus uh, KD? Um, if you would like to take that one, um, Kevin? I guess Kevin and I can split that okay. question. Okay. Go ahead, Kevin. Sure, yeah, I'll go first and then um, I'll, I'll leave it open for your kind of practical experience uh, on it. So uh, when you're thinking about KD, that's a measurement of uh, DLS of the protein in solution. So it's really a holistic measurement of everything going on there uh, that builds up to the total sort of diffusion speed of your, your protein in solution. Uh, B22, on the other hand, is a measure of light scattering, and it actually takes out a few factors that KD measures. So things like uh, sedimentation or buoyancy and excluded volume effect are not present when measuring B22 uh, uh, measurements. So I actually think both are important. I like KD as the holistic measurement of everything going on in a sample. And I like B22 as a way to study uh, things that are very specific to the protein and the way it interacts with salts in your uh, buffer and kind of just pure protein-protein interaction that maybe um, uh, rules out some of the other formulation effects that KD would actually monitor and are still important uh, at the end of the day. Very good answer, Kevin. And then also from the practical experience, um, to be really safe or to make sure your antibody is going to have a good developability profile, that's why we look at both KD and B22 and ensure we have good um, parity between those two to make sure that when the antibody is finding its final formulation, it's not going to have any holdups during the manufacturing process. So those are some of the things we're looking at when we're looking at um, antibodies is making sure they have good um, 
good parity between the KD and B22. Excellent. Thanks, Jack and Kevin. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder to our live audience, you still have time to ask a question. Uh, to do so, all you need to do is type it in where it says ask a question and then press submit. Uh, our next question is for you, uh, Jack. And this one asks them, how will a client know if possible uh, liabilities uh, might be problematic? That's a good question. Um, so the final assessment, which I briefly discussed in the presentation, looking at the mass spec, that's sort of where we kind of where we would look at the final antibodies and determine if those um, liabilities are a problem. Because what we're doing is we're doing the accelerated um, degradation studies. We're also doing a bioassay at the same time while we're running the mass spec of those samples. And let's say the samples do manifest some liabilities by a mass spec, but the biology remains the same then it's up to the client to decide whether that liability is something they can risk moving forward or they want to engineer out. But in the case where the liability does manifest as a change in the biology, then at that point, the client would have to sort of think back and say, okay, do we want to do engineering on this antibody or do we want to select another lead candidate to move forward with? Excellent. Thanks, Jack. Uh, our next question asks, um, can the on-call instrument perform uh, the temperature ramp analysis in buffers with uh, surfactants? Um, Kevin? Yes, it can. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. It's relevant for a lot of customers that are doing, say, a, a DSF analysis on maybe a thermal cycler with something like Cypro orange dye, because at, you know, as temperature increases in samples of surfactant, you can actually form micelles that'll give you false positive signals from cypher orange dye. So being able to look at intrinsic uh, protein fluorescence in the presence of surfactant uh, is one of the great features of Uncle and one of the reasons to move to intrinsic protein fluorescence analysis and away from uh, dye-based analysis with older school uh, DSF analyses. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Um, our next question asks, um, uh, what concentration should the uh, accelerated stability study be performed? Um, Jack, is that something you can help answer? Um, the accelerated study conditions can be performed at, um, at many um, concentrations. Um, I prefer to run them at one mg per mil to sort of save on material. You can run them at 10 mg per mil, and that way you can look for aggregation during those um, stability studies. But um, keeping it kind of low prevents aggregation and other um, um, problems with antibodies that may occur. But that's what I usually run. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. Uh, and our next question asks, um, how do you check uh, the aggregation of antibodies above uh, 20 mg per mil? Um, Jack, is that something you can also um, so That's I can... a good question. There, the instrument also has another feature, and I think Kevin can add to this too, is the G22 measurement, where you can start looking at antibodies at higher and higher concentrations to determine whether those antibodies are going to tend to aggregate in the various buffers. And so with that, you can use the UNCLE um, during the KD and, I mean, during the G22 measurement, as well as um, SECHPLC to see if that is having a problem. And I think Kevin can add a little bit more onto the G22 measurement as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's what I think this uh, question is, is uh, sort of asking about in a way is, uh, since the upper concentration limit for KD and B22 is around 20 uh, milligram per mil for antibodies, uh, that G22 measurement is something that uh, I've seen customers use at a variety of higher concentrations, anywhere from 50 milligram per mil all the way up to 300 mi uh, milligram per mil. And every concentration uh, gives you a G22 result that is very, very similar to uh, KD and B22 result, indicating whether attractions in that high concentration sample are repulsive or attractive. Um, that's exactly how you'd use it. And the only reason why you don't use G22 at lower concentrations is just because uh, of the assumptions it's making. There starts to be larger, um, larger error in the measurement. And so it excels at high concentrations, but at low concentrations when there's higher error, you switch over and use KD and B22. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. And Jack, our next question asks, um, did you normalize aggregation content prior uh, to commencing developmentability uh, assessment on on-call? Um, Jack, uh, that's me you can help answer. Yeah, that's a good question. What you want to do is prior to these liability or these um, um, 
um, developability assessments, you want to get the aggregation content as low as possible. In some cases, you may need to polish the antibody to remove the aggregates, but you want that to be below 5% when you're starting these measurements. Otherwise, you're going to have something that can probably nucleate aggregation sites present in your material. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. Uh, and our no next question is our next question is also uh, for you too. Uh, and this one asks: um, Does uh, Alivumab have any experience of developing antibodies using uh, phage display platforms? Um, at this time, we do not. Excellent. It's a simple answer. Um, yep. Our uh, our next uh, <laughs> question asks: uh, How um, did you prepare your liquid? Uh, of antibodies. Uh, was it by just mixing or using uh, dye for filtration? Um, the way I prepared all the samples and putting them in the appropriate buffers was through a buffer exchange using um, the spin columns or spin, egg, um, spin concentrators, things of that nature. Usually during that process, if I'm doing sort of like um, a G25 or G50 to exchange the buffer, I'll exchange it twice to make sure I have good um, exchange of the material. To make sure the original buffer is not present. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. And just another quick uh, reminder to our live audience you still have time to ask uh, the speakers a question. Uh, to do so, all you need to do is just type it in where it says ask a question and then press submit. Uh, so, our next question asks um, What is a reasonable number of hit antibodies that one can run? within a reasonable time frame uh, with the uh, onco. Uh, I think within your presentation, they saw the data on about seven antibodies. Um, Kevin, is that perhaps something you can sort of start off with answering? Uh, yeah, I can start off with, and then um, uh, Yasa can chime in with probably more input too. So onco runs uh, anywhere from one to 48 wells at a time. So you can run from one to 48 antibodies, or if you run a triplicate, you can run uh, 16 antibodies at a time. And that run will take about two hours, give or take, if you start to um, include all the, the sample prep and loading in that. And uh, so if you're running a sample, you know, you can get multiple batches in per day and then perhaps another one overnight. Uh, and so you can get in the hundreds of antibodies uh, per week, um, maybe up to a thousand if you really, really uh, are motivated, we'll say, and organized. I agree. Um, also, additionally, for the KD and B22 measurements, and you're, since you're running the samples in triplicate, and in my case, I was running five um, pH conditions for each sample. Um, I mean, I was running two pH, I mean, three pH conditions for each sample with um, five different concentrations. That took up um, all three unis on the system, so I was able to run one antibody every about um, two hours or so with prep time and data workup and everything else. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. And Kevin, our next question asks, um, if you want to increase the pH uh, and buffer exchange after storing, uh, what possible problems um, might you face? Um, who would like to take that one? Um, that's, um, I, I don't really understand the question, but I think after the antibody is, um, put in its final storage buffer, there is really no changing the, the buffer, the buffer, um, the pH of that buffer. So once it's formulated, that's what the, the antibody is living in for the remainder of its lifetime in that buffer. If you're worried about, um, changing, if you're worried about, um, the antibody precipitating out or things of that nature, there are studies you can run to see how the, the antibody will behave once it gets diluted into sort of a higher pH buffer. Um, in that case, you can run a couple of different experiments to do that, but I think that's what the question is asking. Yeah, I would say during a storage experiment, you've kind of, uh, uh, the storage is the point, so to speak. So you've kind of made your bed in terms of what you want to test. Um, but I'll say, you know, Anytime you're changing pH or, or doing uh, any kind of buffer exchange, um, aggregation can be a problem. You are you know have a lot of uh, shear forces and, and high surface areas uh, during things like that. Um, and I would be remiss that I, I want to mention, uh, but in terms of buffer exchange, there is an Unchained Labs product called Big Tuna that is meant to uh, automate buffer exchange as well. So not the purpose of the talk today, but if you're interested in looking at buffer exchange, something you can uh, check out for us.
Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, our next question asks, um, would uh, reduction of monomeric uh, antibodies uh, by uh, SEC HPLC typically show up in any of the um, onco uh, analysis? Um, Kevin, is that something you can help answer? So yeah, I could take a first pass at this one. So um, my understanding of this question is essentially if you're looking at monomer loss and something you typically get by a SAC HPLC analysis, um, how can UNCLE sort of relate to that, that sort of long-term monomer loss by SEC analysis? And so the answer is that's, that's a, a, a big, you know, purpose of running these kinds of TM and TAG experiments on UNCLE is looking for conditions that are going to uh, have the, the most unstable antibody, have the most egregious aggregation conditions, and filter those out. So... Uh, kind of the worst performers, they get screened out by the uncle experiment um, because those will have the worst TMs and the worst TAGs. And by contrast, the, the best performers will have the best TMs and best TAGs. And those best performers are what you move on to a, a storage experiment uh, where SEC might be your final ultimate ana you know, analytical readout. Um, so I would say uncle analysis is a really great step prior to, to doing those long-term uh, storage or accelerated storage experiments because those TM and TAG experiments are going to help you screen for candidates that are worth spending the time and resources on uh, storage and SEC analysis. Excellent. I don't have anything to add. I think Kevin did a pretty good job answering that question. Did a really good job answering that question. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, our next question asks, um, what buffer would you recommend for the um, accelerated stability? Study. For the accelerated stabilities um, studies, I would do the way we do it is we run it at pH um, 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 4.5 and 8.5 for the deamidation isomerizations, and we usually run those. We run those for two weeks and four week time points, and then we do the do the analysis for the bioassays and for the mass spec at best time points. Excellent. So carbonate for high pH yeah, no, and I'll defer for low pH. Sorry, Kevin, please follow. Yeah, follow in. I was, I was going to say I'll defer to Jacek's experience on this one. And the only thing that I'll, I'll add is that if you're running something on UNCLE, then you can understand when things start to unfold and actually help to set the temperature mm -hmm. of those accelerated stability studies so that it's below uh, when unfolding and aggregation start to be a problem. Yes. Very good addition to that, Kevin. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question asks, um, does uh, Alivimab services offer uh, any bi-specific antibody discovery? Um, um, the best way to answer that question would probably be to email us at info at alivimab.com where we'd be able to address that question in a little bit more detail. I don't have the time or bandwidth to address it right now. Excellent. Uh, our next question asks, um, have you observed antibody isotype dependent aggregation effects? Hmm. Um, I'll start that. For the most part, we only, I've so far have run only IgG1 through the different um, assays. So I haven't really spent much time looking at like IgG2 or IgG4 to see if there are any kind of um, issues or um, observed increased aggregation based on the isotype of the antibody. Kevin, do you have any input on that? Uh, not off the top of my head. I, I am aware of a couple of papers that looked at uh, mutations in the FC region of a few different isotypes and were tracking the impact on TM and TAG. Um, and those, mostly when I was reading through those, I was aware of those as uh, you know, control versus mutant. Uh, and I wasn't really reading those through the lens of isotype versus isotype. Um, so there is some literature out there about that, but I don't think I can conclusively answer that right now. It's something I can follow up on. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin and uh, Jack. Uh, well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Uh, I would now like to thank Dr. Jacek Ostrowski and Dr. Kevin Lance for their presentations and for answering your questions. And of course, you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.